Hello friends, welcome to the Eastern Front channel. Today we will talk about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus adjutant Wilhelm Adam. He fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943 in Stalingrad. In his memoirs, he tells in detail the story of the Wehrmacht disaster near the city on the Volga River. Links to other parts of his memories can be found in the description below the video. The Soviet ultimatum was known to practically everybody. Colonel Elklep confirmed it to me. As among the staff, it was made known to almost everyone in the army and the pros and cons discussed. Those awaiting the return of Hoob and the new plans for liberation were far more excited. The mood pendulum, which in the last 14 days had returned to doubt and apathy, swung back to the side of hope and courage. Are the poor lads aware of what can be awaiting them with the planned meeting with the relief force in the middle of February? Do you really believe, Elklep, that we will get out of this? and that our troops can hold on for another six weeks. Yes, Adam, I really do believe it. You can be assured that Paulus will, as before, definitely carry out the Führer's orders. Schmidt and I will reinforce him in this to the full. I don't understand one thing. Why does the Colonel General demand freedom of action then? In this present phase, one can only understand the suspension of the fighting because further resistance is futile. Breakthrough to the main front about 400 kilometers away is completely impossible from our heap of rubble. There is no difference of opinion between us over this. You say that capitulation does not come into the question. What will happen then, the fighting strength of our army is now sinking rapidly and will soon come to an end. Then we will go down as obedient soldiers. I repeat what I have said to you on other occasions. I will never go into Russian captivity. Do you believe that all soldiers and officers think as you do? I strongly doubt it. What well, little desire the men have to risk their lives in a more than questionable resistance is shown by a great aversion to the emergency units. Now we want to comb through again and set up more. Consequently, they are almost worthless. These men unaccustomed to fighting melt away like snow in the spring sunshine. You should think more about the calls for help from the troop commanders, Adam. The front sector of the 297th Infantry Division is only man skin deep. There are not the slightest reserves to seal off a breakthrough. Every man that we send them counts. We can't throw in the towel. It seems to me that Sell and Hooven have turned your head. Surrender is completely out of the question. That is all communist propaganda that they put in their leaflets. I don't believe a word of it. It only remains for us to fight to the last round. I could not penetrate such obstinacy. A rational conversation was impossible. On the afternoon of the 9th January, Paulus made an appeal to the troops. In it, the offer of surrender was written off as enemy propaganda aimed at undermining the soldiers' morale. No member of the army could believe the pamphlets. The order of the hour was much more to resolutely repel every enemy thrust until our renewed tank unit attacks had re-established connection with us. With hope, once more revived that the cauldron would be pierced from outside, and the underlying fear of captivity, the will to hold on flared up again. Even the wounded grabbed their weapons once more. In contrast to this, there was an incident of reluctance by the troops, including the generals, to act. General Hoop had just resumed command of his panzer corps when the army high command ordered him to fly out immediately. He was to reorganize the supply of the 6th army outside the cauldron. This was really a paradox. Of all people, the commanding general of the Panzer Corps was leaving the cauldron to take over a task better conducted by a professional. That was why the army headquarters had appointed the senior quartermaster, Colonel Botter, already weeks before. Was this a consequence of Hoob's visit to Fur headquarters? Why had he already flown out? Similar questions were asked of me repeatedly by generals and officers, making no secret of their anger. I too knew no more than they knew what was behind Hoob's order to fly out. General Hu climbed into an aircraft flying out on the night of the 10th January. At my suggestion, Lieutenant General Schlomer, commander of the 3rd Motorized Infantry Division, took over the command of the 14th Panzer Corps. There were several individual well-known cases in which officers tried to sneak out of the cauldron. One such was the 1st General Staff Officer of the 14th Panzer Division, Lieutenant Colonel Petzold. He asked me to obtain him permission to fly out from Schmidt. What should I do here now, he said. The division hardly exists anymore. 
its remains have been incorporated into battle groups. The divisional commander, Colonel Latman, is forming new emergency units on the orders of the commander-in-chief, so I am completely superfluous. I suggested to Petzold that he take his request personally to Major General Schmidt, as he came directly under him as a general staff officer. He did that, as was to be expected, the chief of staff promptly kicked him out. But the lieutenant colonel had not given up, he tried again under a different guise. Promptly the next day, he put in his application for a transfer to the SS. But he had no luck with Schmidt, his crumpled application ended up in the waste paper basket. More cunning was the quartermaster of the 8th Corps. Knowing that he would never be permitted to fly out, he went directly to Potomac. He said that he had to clarify some supply problems and was thus able to climb into an aircraft ready to take off. When Paulus heard of the quartermaster's clever trick, he applied to Army Groot Don for a court-martial for desertion. As I later learned, this quartermaster was shot. But such cases of personal deceit among the officers were exceptional. The majority of officers took the order to fight to the last round seriously, sharing the hunger, pain, misery, and death with their soldiers. But what they took as moral duty, loyalty, and obedience was, through the criminal concept of war and the irresponsible conduct of the long-involved highest state and Wehrmacht leadership, nothing but shameless deceit. Their superhuman devotion rose out of a false trust. They were prisoners of military ideology. In this lay the tragedy of many of those German soldiers and officers who fought and died at Stalingrad, and the senior military leaders of the 6th Army contributed to this tragedy. The air thundered, the ground shook. Steel rained down on Fortress Stalingrad, savaging people and animals, destroying dugouts and vehicles, tearing apart weapons and telephone lines. The links between Army headquarters and the staff were reduced to a few radio sets that had escaped the shells, mines, and rockets. The Red Army was replying to our rejection of the offer of surrender. We are writing on the 10th January 1943. In the Aya's dugout, the wireless operator was trying to reach the 8th Corp. At the beginning of the bombardment, a message had got through that reported devastating results from the bombardment. Then the corpse fell silent. The connection was broken. While we waited feverishly until the repair teams had reconnected the line, the artillery fire eased off. Presumably, the enemy's tanks and infantry were going into the attack. Then the 8th Corps came through again. Soviet tanks had broken through our western front and part of our southern front, simply crushing their way through. Our troops were fighting doggedly, but in vain. They were unable to withstand this attack, especially as few anti-tank weapons were available. Even the rifle ammunition was almost gone. There were also no collection points for them. Despite the orders of the Chief of Staff, Schmidt, it was not possible to dig trenches and bunkers in the concrete hard frozen ground. Those who did not fall or fled were captured in the second or third waves of attacking Soviet units. The armored attacking wedge was biting ever deeper into our front. We had no reserves that we could throw in against it. Gradually, we gained a clearer picture of the new situation. The main attack had been against the divisions of the 8th Corps and the 14th Panzer Corps. Its goal was the heart of the cauldron at Potomac Airfield. The 44th, 76th, and 29th motorized infantry divisions were badly hit. For the moment, it was not possible to get an idea of which of these divisions still existed and could be employed in a renewed defense. Bad news arrived continually by radio and telephone. The first orderly officer had his hands full maintaining the situation map. There also seemed to be a disaster in the southwestern corner of the cauldron. The third, motorized infantry division had been there since the end of November 1942. Now the districts of Mitrievka in the west and Rokotino and Zybenko in the south had been lost. The first general staff officer looked at these places. I looked questioningly at him. Are you thinking that the third, Motorized Infantry Division is threatened with encirclement, Elklep. Certainly, until now the division has been able to repulse all enemy attacks. Now, however, since the loss of the Dmitrievka and Rokotino districts, it has become threatened on both flanks. We must immediately retake these southwest, pointing projections. He reached for the telephone receiver and had himself connected to the Chief of Staff, newly promoted to Lieutenant General. 
Schmidt was already in the picture, as was Colonel General Paulusk was with him. The division received orders to get itself out of the encirclement and take up a new defensive position along the line to retrieve Corocotino. Messengers and orderly officers came and went one after another at the headquarters on this disastrous day. It was hard to distinguish between any of these numbered figures of soldiers. Only eyes, mouth, and nose could be seen of these material shrouded figures, their legs and feet being mainly woned round with cut up blankets. What remained was dressed in faded, worn out greatcoats. Only a fortunate few possessed winter clothing, and that was mainly of Russian origin. With their frosted hands, they were often unable to unfasten the clasps of their mat cases and pull out the messages. Once they had slurped down two glasses of tea, they recounted in spurts their frightful experiences in the past hours, the shot of artillery positions and exploded ammunition dumps, the panic among the supply troops and the wounded. While their legs still carried them, they were fleeing into the city on the Volga in naked fear, throwing everything away like children. A second lieutenant from a division on the southwestern front recounted how in the last two days, two or three German communists had called across asking them to give up fighting and go over to the Russians. We have heard such propaganda often already. I cannot go along with them. What is new, nevertheless, is that now a German captain and two lieutenants have gone over to the communists. To all the soldiers react like you, I asked him. They listened to the words, but they don't believe them either. In fact, fear of capture was so great that even in the most hopeless situations, where every minute of continuing to hold on could bring death only a few, soldiers went over to the Red Army. The year-long business of anti-Soviet agitation was fully absorbed in the thoughts and behavior of most Germans. This disabled the brain and alone drove tens of thousands to their death in the Stalingrad cauldron, when they could have been spared if only they had listened to the voices from the other side. Colonel General Paulus reported the results of difficult breaches on the cauldron's western and southern fronts. He added that 6th Army Headquarters saw no real opportunity of preventing the enemy advance. Nevertheless, thronged together emergency units had occupied the threatened positions. Although Paulus and Schmidt were clear that a further weakening of the divisions fighting within the city was no longer their responsibility, they ordered the List Corps to give up the most available battalions, companies, and artillery units to the western and southern fronts. The military machinery groaned but kept going. It obeyed its own laws. Colonel General Paulus was himself in deadly danger, suffering from the burden of his responsibility. But he, like those around him, believed that the blame for the catastrophe must lie not only with Hitler, but also with the Army High Command and Army Group Don. Meanwhile, we went on functioning with bleeding hearts and tormented souls, and this continuation cost many their lives. I will never forget the talk that I had with Paulus on the evening of the 10th January 1943. It demonstrated our personal conflict, but also the fact that we then agreed on all final measures for the continuation of the war. We believed that the 6th Army had to be sacrificed for this. My dear Adam, many soldiers and officers are now asking why did Paulus not accept the ultimatum? Why, in this hopeless situation, did he not handle it against Hitler's orders? They know that I have no right to go against the orders of the High Command, but it was not only that which prevented me from complying with the capitulation. What would become of the war if our army in the Caucasus was also surrounded? That danger is real. But as long as we keep on fighting, the Red Army has to remain here. They need these forces for a big offensive against Army Group A in the Caucasus and along the still unstable front from Voronish to the Black Sea. We must hold them here to the last so that the Eastern Front can be stabilized. Only if that happens is there a chance of the war going well for Germany. If I may be allowed to make a remark, Colonel General, I too in your place would equally decline to decide upon capitulation. But let us suppose for once, would the Russian armies released from here really not take weeks to get to the front 300 kilometers away? There you are certainly making an error. The Russians are great at improvisation, as the past has repeatedly shown. What seems impossible to us, they make possible. With our dubious situation in the southern sector, any strengthening of the enemy forces can be disastrous for us. I will perhaps be responsible should this war be lost. We must fight on to prevent such a catastrophe. 
Neither Colonel General Paulus nor I then thought that the actual misfortune in starting a war was that it had politically, economically, and militarily been an anachronism from the beginning, because it went contrary to the passage of time. The First World War had already shown that the policy of conquest and robbery that had been practiced by some imperialist states in the 19th century could not be repeated in the 20th century. The war represented a challenge to other states who united against the German desire for conquest and punished the instigator. Even more anachronistic was the unequivocal starting of the Second World War by Hitler's Germany. It had to be shattered by the will to resist of the people, especially the socialist might of the Soviet Union. The key questions regarding the character of the war, its historical role and its political moralistic aim were not challenged by us. We were too far away from this to even recognize it. Brought up in a nationalistic and military spirit, we could hardly challenge it. That was the real key to our misfortune, the door to the abyss into which we were thrown ever deeper through our accepted duty to hold on. As on the 10th January, so followed on subsequent days one frightful piece of news after another. They were all the same, renewed breaches in the makeshift enclosed defensive ring, flight from attacking tanks, abandoning of positions without orders to do so, the failure of commanders of emergency units, signs of disintegration everywhere. Especially alarming news came on the 12th January. Potomac, our only airfield, had been abandoned in flight from Russian tanks. The chief of staff was enraged. How could such a thing happen? After the last report, we had the impression that no immediate danger threatened there. Was this just a rumor? Schmidt wanted to know for certain, as it would have an immediate effect upon army headquarters. The reconnaissance team returned after a short time. It appeared that our troops, airmen, drivers, medical staff, and wounded, had taken to their heels from an enemy reconnaissance troop, which had subsequently withdrawn. This time I could understand Schmidt's scornful outburst. Paulus ordered the airfield to be more strongly protected and put back in action as soon as possible. Afterwards, a staff officer who had driven to Potomac to pick up the post reported, Within a few minutes it was absolute chaos. He recounted, On the cry, the Russians are coming. Healthy, sick, and wounded rushed out of tents and bunkers, everyone trying to reach the exits as quickly as possible. Some fell and were trampled down. Those unable to walk properly clung on to colleagues, stumbling on with sticks or rifles and hobbling in the icy cold towards Stalingrad. Many wounded and exhausted men collapsed on the way. No one looked after them. Several hours later, they were frozen. Bitter fighting broke out over places on vehicles. Luftwaffe ground staff, medical orderlies, and lightly wounded ran off to the few trucks standing on the edge of Potomac Airfield, started up the engines, and tried to get to the road leading to the city. In a short while, men were hanging on to the wings, running boards, and even the radiators. The vehicles threatened to break apart under the loads. Many remained immobile from lack of fuel or engine damage. Those following made detours round them. Those men capable of walking hurried more or less quickly away, the others calling for help. But not for long, their calls soon ceased from the freezing that overcame them. There was only one motto, save yourselves those who can. What safety could the destroyed city give that was now also being attacked by the enemy from the Volga? It was not only a matter of physical safety, but more especially was an escape from the fear-driven delusions of whipped, ragged, half-dead men whose bodies and spirits had been torn apart by the destructive battle. Although it very quickly became known that the airfield was back in our hands, it had been torn apart by a Soviet reconnaissance party, and only a few of the sick and wounded turned back. The shock was too deeply seated in their bones. On the other hand, most of the pilots and medical orderlies were back in Potomac by evening. Dear friends, that's all for today. Please support this video with any comment and don't forget to press like. It was Tim, and see you.